kids podcast. <laughs> you can go slow. A kids podcast about. Hi, grown-ups. Mental wellness begins early. A Kids Co. has curated a range of audio, video, and book resources for the kids in your life for whatever journey they're on. Check out all the content by visiting akidsco.com and typing Mental Health Matters into the search. You are not alone, and neither are your kids. That's akidsco.com and type Mental Health Matters into the search bar. This is Sarah Jones Breaks It Down. I'm Sarah, and I'm here to help us better understand what's happening in the world. Why? Because as a journalist, that's my job. And this world isn't just filled with adults. Nope. It's our world. So every week, we'll talk about the stories that you may overhear some adults talking about, and we'll break it down. Break it down. down. Break it down. Mass shootings. Seems like they're on the news every other week. And it's when four or more victims are murdered with a firearm in a single event. And your generation is growing up in a world where they're becoming way too common. And as adults argue over policies and rights and gun control, have you ever heard them talk about Dickey's Amendment? It's a piece of legislation that makes researching gun violence from a public health perspective a little tricky. And in this episode, we're going to explain why. Before we really get into Dickey's Amendment, we have to break down the difference between research and opinion. And here with me to help break down all of this is Dr. Angela Moreland, who is the Associate Director of Research at a center called the National Mass Violence Victimization Resource Center, or NMVVRC. Our center was developed and it was funded as a cooperative agreement with the Office for Victims of Crime about four years ago. And we don't lobby. We are very, um, very intentional about that. We are specifically researching the impact of incidents that occur on people. Before NMVVRC, research was mostly focused on a specific mass violence incident. But the center works with others to pull the research together and analyze incidents across locations. So we have partners with multiple organizations and multiple places across the country. And our big job is to kind of be the connector and to be able to, when someone requests something regarding mass violence, whether that be an organization or, um, or Congress or you know, governors, mayors, but also specific cities or specific sites because something's occurred, they can contact us and then our job is to get the resources in their hands when they need them. So first, as promised, let's get into the difference between research and opinion. I could say that, you know, red M&Ms are my favorite and you could say that blue are yours. And if that's our opinion, that's correct. However, if we studied and we surveyed, say, 10,000 people and we had them taste the M&M and say which one is the best and red came out most of the time, we still can't say with fact that red is the best M&M because we didn't ask everyone in the world. So we have to, it's not a fact, but what we would say is research shows that the red M&Ms are the best. And that's basically saying that we studied and we researched a lot of people and that's what the finding was. So research is based on actual findings of whether it be that's more behavioral research. And some research is inconclusive. You know, we do it and we don't have a significant finding. And that may be because we don't really know. But once we hit a certain amount of significance, so once, and it's about 80%, once we know with with pretty good certainty that that's there, then that's when we can say research supports that. And research is basically, to information based on fact-finding, right? Yes, exactly. So people will then sometimes take that information and make decisions, like Eminem might then decide, oh, we're going to make a bag of just red M&Ms, since people love it. And that's why, the, why research is so incredibly important, because 
one person can have an opinion and think that, but the only real way to make decisions and whether it's marketing decisions, you know, from a company or whether it's medical decisions or it's decisions for us on what do victims need after gun violence. So we do research. But research has to go through a critical review process called vetting. And it's always important to check whether the research you're looking at is reliable. A quick way to check your sources is one, check where the research funding is coming from. Two, check how the data is collected. Was it a survey of a specific audience? Was it done at random? How many people were asked? Was it 10 or thousands? And three, has it been peer reviewed? If an article has been peer reviewed, it will say that, or the journal may state that all research has been peer reviewed. If something has been peer reviewed, it means it has gone through a specific process where the author's work has been thoroughly vetted by others who are experts in the same field. That's why it's called peer reviewed, because it's done by peers. This step is necessary for ensuring academic scientific quality. Going through this quick checklist can be really helpful for any kind of scientific study. There have been hundreds of mass shootings across the U.S. this year in 2022. But when you look at actual numbers, it's actually only 2% of homicides that occur in the United States each year. One thing that NMVVRC noticed when compiling data from several mass shooting incidents was the impact it had on the mental health of the community where it happened. Of the people who live in a community where a mass shooting has happened, 70% are generally scared it will happen again. Researchers are looking at how they can better support communities. How can we improve lives for victims so that we can hopefully decrease these from happening again and decrease that fear that, you know, that it will happen at all times. It's this balance between making sure we prepare communities and prepare people for what could happen, but also not have people live in fear of that happening at all times. Mass shootings take a huge toll on the community's health. And I'm talking about the entire community, people who weren't at the shooting, but happened to just live in the area where the incident happened. They have more significant mental health problems. They have much higher levels of PTSD and depression than the general population. You have many more mental health problems. And then I think one of the major findings that we found is that of people who had prior trauma. So if you had experienced physical assault or sexual assault in the past, you were much more impacted. But Dr. Moreland says there are ways to counter that negative impact on the mental health of a community. Social support is a big impact on that. So because of research, we now know a bit more of how mass shootings impact a community and some ideas on the best ways to support them. But what about the questions that are on everyone's mind? why it's happening in America and how we can decrease that. I mean, why these incidents are happening. What is the follow-up? What is the risk? Why don't we know the answers to those yet when we you know, have a generation now that's grown up with this kind of happening? I mean, one piece is because of the limits on research that have happened that hopefully is improving um, over the past few years. So Dickey's amendment was passed in 1996 that says CDC, which is the Center for Disease Control, could not fund any research that was looking at gun safety or gun violence. So that has significantly impacted our field for the past 20 years because it has made it very difficult. It's tremendously reduced the budget by eliminating federal dollars. Which in the research world, most of what we do is federal dollars. We don't, our institutions don't pay for research. It's the government that pays for research in order to be able to improve science and increase um, science and knowledge. And the amendment still stands. There have been several um, attempts and several different pieces of language that have come out that have kind of made it a little bit more lenient that says, yes, you can, you can research gun safety, you can research gun violence, um, but the funding just isn't there. Researching mass gun violence as a public health issue isn't easy. What makes it really difficult is that people tend to look at it as a very black and white issue that a lot of times if we research gun, anything about guns, it means that we're, people are trying to change laws or that people are trying to change, you know, gut, 
opinions about gun violence. However, the main piece of it is that we need to be able to have research to examine just what the impact of mass violence in general is. And a lot of times that's limited because it is this blanket amendment and this blanket law. There have recently been spikes in funding. So in fiscal year 2020, oh, so yeah, about two years ago, the fiscal year federal budget did include $25 million for CDC and NIH to research um, reducing gun-related deaths and injuries. And that's probably been the closest that we've been able to get to examining victimization caused by guns. But that's still research after it happens. Well, Yes, it is. And it has to be, it's very tricky. It's a very thin line between being able to examine gun impacts and not have it be making recommendations towards what should happen when it comes to gun control, I think is the main piece. What would have to change for you to be able to research any aspect of gun violence to kind of in an unrestricted way find out why this is happening and how to stop it before it happens, what would you need? I mean, I think Dickey's amendment is a huge piece of it. I also just think it's a, a very political piece and a very political part. And I think a lot, we would have to come a lot further as far as being open, because I think the problem with research is we conduct the research and we are independent researchers. Our job is to conduct the research and then explain the findings And if we're afraid to explain the findings because they don't line up with what the government would like or what whoever the funding source would like, then that causes a concern. So I think that's where the biggest piece of it comes in is as researchers, our job is to present the actual findings. So if we find something that is not that is controversial or that doesn't necessarily line up with specific agendas, then that makes it very difficult both for us to be able to do that, but then also we risk further funding because if that happens, will we get funded again to be able to study something that people want a specific answer to? So now you know a little bit more about Dickey's Amendment and researching mass gun violence as a public health issue, but information is for everyone. And everyone matters. Everyone matters. Everyone matters. Everyone matters. Everyone matters. That's why we make sure to cover stories that aren't in the headlines but should be. So remember last time when we explained justice and peacekeeping? Well, there's a case that's heading to the International Court of Justice. It's a genocide case against Myanmar over war crimes and atrocities committed against the Rohingya people who are an ethnic minority group in the Asian country. Some of the war crimes the military in Myanmar are accused of include mass murder and torturing villages with the, quote, intent to destroy the Rohingya as a group in whole or in part. And targeting a group of people with an intent to erase them from the world is genocide. So we'll be following this case and we'll keep you posted on it. Thank you for listening and for breaking it down with me today. If you have a question about Myanmar or mass violence or Dickey's Amendment, or if there's something else going on in the world that you want us to break down, write to us or record a message and email us at listen at akidsco.com. Sarah Jones Breaks It Down is written and reported by me, Sarah Jones. You can learn more about me and my work at sarahjonesreports.com. Our show is edited and produced by Matthew Winner with help from Chad Michael Snavely and the team at Sound On Studios. Our executive producer is Jelani Memory, and this show is brought to you by Kids Podcast About. Follow the show on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are found. And check out our other podcasts made for kids just like you by visiting akidsco.com. Thank you for hanging out with me and stay curious. A Kids Podcast About is a proud member of Kids Listen, the best place to discover the best in kids podcasts. Our friend Linz Amer of the Activist You podcast has a new show for grown-ups we think you'll like a whole lot. Hi, friends. Welcome to Rainbow Parenting, a brand new queer and gender-affirming parenting podcast. But this show isn't just for parents. It's also for educators, caregivers, librarians, really anyone who knows, loves, and works with kids. I'm your host, Linz Amer. 
I'm the creator of Queer Kids Stuff, and I make queer and trans media for kids and families all over the internet. Most of the stuff I make is for kids, but this time I'm talking to you, the grown-ups. Queer Kids Stuff is the kind of show I wish I had when I was a confused little queer and trans kid who didn't have the language to express who I am. But this show is all about what I wish my parents and teachers and caregivers knew when they were raising me so they could have helped me along the way. Rainbow Parenting gives you the tools and strategies and know-how you need to raise kids in a queer and gender-affirming way, even if you don't know how. Me and a whole bunch of my friends and experts in the field are going to help you navigate LGBTQ plus and social justice topics with the kids in your lives. We're on a mission to spread queer joy and raise a new generation of supported and affirmed queer, trans, and non-binary kids and their allies. Our first episode drops on May 30th, and we'll upload new episodes every Monday through early August. That's all we've got for now. Talk soon. 